Magnus Carlsen wins the Bilbao Masters final with a round to spare and finishes with more victories than the rest of the field combined. Big news about Baku, it is official Team Armenia will not be competing in this year's Chess Olympiad. And finally, a new study reveals that chess apparently does not make your kids smarter. Alexandra and I discuss the controversial results and findings of this England case study. Chess Center pairing well with a nice Merlot and a very subtle blue cheese since 1951. Let's enjoy. Back from Bill Bow, where he was on site with all of his great coverage and videos, is Peter Dockers. Peter, how did the event round up, and what are the major storylines for us? Hey, Danny. Good to be back in Amsterdam, although I must say I am missing the pinchos, the, the great little bites uh, of food that they have in the bus country. But, uh, yeah, let's talk chess. Uh, we were talking about the Belbao Masters final, and, uh, yeah, it was Magnus Carlsen who uh, won the tournament very convincingly. He uh, scored four wins, which was more than the rest of the field combined. And those wins included his very first victory over uh, Michael Petriot, the uh, Dutch Grandmaster Anish Giri. They had played 15 games before. Anish had won the very first, Wycan 2011, and then 14 draws. And then in this game, uh, Magnus finally won. Let's quickly have a look uh, how, he, uh, how he managed to beat him. Um, in this position, there's uh, Bishop and Knight versus a Rook, but there's not much material left, so it should be uh, a draw, actually. But uh, already uh, under pressure and in time trouble, uh, Anish uh, put his Rook on a wrong square. He should have played Queen A6 here, and it's very hard uh, for White to uh, avoid uh, the Queens uh, being traded. But uh, the Rook goes to A8, and that was a mistake. The Rook is unprotected there, so it allows a tactic Knight takes F5. Next, of course, is uh, queen takes d5 with check. You cannot allow that, so queen e6 had to be played, but after queen g5, g6, and a, third, a few further moves, uh, yeah, the attack was just too strong for white. So, um, yeah, first win for Magnus and uh, tournament victory. Uh, it was a good fighting game, I thought. Um, right from the start, I knew I was not feeling so great, so I probably wouldn't be able to calculate. Uh, but I was very much playing playing uh, sort of the man. Uh, it was, was an interesting game. We both missed a number of things, but uh, I mean, um, dynamically it was interesting. Uh, and then, you know, of course it was, uh, was very nice to, to, to beat him. I, I would have much preferred uh, to win the first, uh, first game against him because that would have been cleaner and also felt better than, but um, still it's good. Now, this month is being deemed the month of matches with so many going on. Why don't you tell us how many there are and what the updates are on those events? Yeah, it looked a little bit like that. Suddenly, a couple of matches uh, taking place at the same time. In Russia, there was a match between Boris Gelfand and Ernesto Inarkiev, a match between the uh, vice uh, world champion of 2012 and the reigning European champion. But uh, yeah, Gelfand's experience uh, was uh, was worth a, a lot more. He won this match uh, with big numbers, actually. And uh, uh, yeah, on the other side of the globe, in uh, in China, Ding Li Ren uh, faced another Russian, uh, Alexander Grishuk, and uh, the latter uh, won the first of four games, and it was uh, d decisive. So uh, Grishuk won that match. And then at the moment, a match underway uh, between Maxim Vosjelegraaf and Peter Svitler in, in Biel. It's part of the annual Biel Chess Festival, but there's no uh, uh, Super Grandmaster Tournament this year. There are three matches, and this is the main one. Uh, on the first day, there were four rapid games, and uh, MVL won that section two and a half, one and a half. And at the time of uh, recording, uh, Maxim uh, also scored one and a half, half in the classical games. And uh, that means uh, one draw and one win. And he now has a live rating of 28-15. The Frenchman uh, is doing very well. Only eight players in history did better than uh, he has uh, so far. We will keep our eyes on that one and keep our eyes tuned to chess.com slash news and all that you bring us each week, Peter. All right. See you next week. Well, Robert, I don't know what Putin is putting in the water in Siberia, but it is leading to some exciting play on the board at the 17th Poikovsky Karpov Tournament, and perhaps none more exciting than the one covered here in our move of the week. Yakovenko had the white pieces against Emil Satovsky and played a move that immediately took this game to the next level as far as the destination in Crazy Town. Tell everybody what that was and why this tournament, normally not getting a lot of love because it's sandwiched between so many big summer events, was worth us covering here in the Move of the Week. 
Well, while the tournament might be overlooked, Yakovenko wanted to have a summer love and have himself a blast, and he went knight d5 check here against Utovsky. The idea is simple, break open the king. After e takes d5, rook takes c5, well, that knight on e5 is immune because queen g5 check picks up that queen on d8. So instead, Sutovsky grabbed the pawn on e4. And, well, Yakovega continued the attack, doubling the rooks in the c-file. And after bishop e6 here, Yakovega missed his shot with pawn d5. But queen e3 was an acceptable move. And after queen to d6, once again, this is where the wheel started falling off. He missed his chance with pawn to d5. Yeah, and missing his chance one more time to open up potential tactics on this diagonal really proved key because when he played the move queen takes e4, Emil Satowski found king to d8. There may be some other moves, but such a nice, subtle retreat of the king. All of a sudden, white felt the grasp slipping away and just went on complete tilt, sacrificing the house, but unfortunately not coming up with enough, eventually being forced to simplify into an endgame where he was just down a rook and went on to lose the game. So not very often that a move is interesting and exciting enough to be featured as move of the week, even though the person went on to lose. But maybe Satovsky gets some credit for his very nice defensive finds as well. Look for more from the Boykovsky coming up in our Blunder of the Week segment. Breaking news, Alexandra. Apparently chess does not make kids smarter. Or at least that's what a study done in England with 3,000 primary students designed to sort of challenge a previous study done in Italy that said chess does directly correlate to better math scores. Uh, it challenged that study and said that in, in their findings, there, there was no direct correlation, no real concrete improvements directly related back to chess. But you and I dove into this, and you read the study along with the article, and, and I understand you have some opinions about maybe the methodology that was done and really what the approach was trying to prove that maybe isn't isn't the best way to decide whether or not chess improves general intelligence. Tell us what you, what you think about that. So I'd like to start off first by pointing out that the title was slightly misleading. So the title was similar to chess does not make your kids smarter when if you look at how the study was conducted, the research question was more of does chess have an impact on math test results? And the reason why I don't know this is, if this is the best way to test the value of teaching your kid chess is because, first of all, in some of the cases, they actually took out a math class and replaced it with chess. Hmm. So, and then they would test the results kids had on their math exam. This seems, seems a, little a little counterproductive, right? A little, exactly. a little weird to do that, yeah. Definitely counterproductive to be doing that. And the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is. If you're doing a test on the value of chess in schools for young kids, I think it would have to be a study that takes more time. And I think you'd also have to differentiate between um, specific intelligence, so in a subject like math, and general intelligence, so thinking more skills like concentration, focus. And I would like to see a study that would be done that would look more on kids who played more chess, how did their concentration change versus kids who played chess, how do they do on a subject test on a completely different subject? Right. But I guess the, the headline of does chess directly improve your standardized testing scores for the bureaucracy of education really doesn't, it's not as catchy as chess. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't have make it quite smarter. the ring to it. <laughs> it doesn't have quite the same ring to it. So they did what they needed to do to get eyeballs. It certainly got our attention here on Chess <laughs> Center, and we'll ask the fans to leave a comment and let us know what they think. Maybe you have personal experience with your kids playing chess, uh, or maybe you are a coach who has seen it used in the classroom effectively or not effectively. Leave a comment, let us know, and uh, we look forward to more information coming out about this as chess continues to grow in schools worldwide. <laughs> One of the biggest stories to hit the chess press this week, Mike, of course, is that it was official, a statement released from the Armenian Chess Federation that they will not be competing in the Olympiad this year in Baku, Azerbaijan. Obviously a very big deal, uh, but I'm going to let you take the wheel on this story and give us the details behind the decision. Just coming across our desk, you're right, Danny, they will not be going back to Baku. Players like Levan Aronian will not be participating, unlike the last Chess World Cup where they did go. We caught up with the Vice President Legendary Grandmaster Simbat Lapushian and the Armenian Chess Federation's Vice President had this to say. The Armenian delegation suggested that a non-controversial locale be chosen so as to not cause conflict, as naturally any Armenian wished to take part in the tournament in a fair manner. We regret that our offer was not accepted, and I regret that the tournament will be held without the recent three-time championship team 
clearly an outcome that no fan of the sport would like to see. That was a direct quote. He also said that he understands that no player that does not feel to be safe in a particular environment would be able to play their best chess. And as a former top-ranking player, we can definitely understand what he had to say. Danny, we've reached out to FIDE for their response about what kind of uh, alternate location was offered and why that was not accepted. And should they respond to us, we will tell you what they said on the next chess center. Yes, of course, disappointing news when no one ever likes when the chess world is divided in this way, but certainly uh, we understand and respect the decision and we look forward to more. Let's move on to a lighter note. Last week, Mike, we touched on the Nidorf Memorial taking place in Poland. Super strong event, but we never actually got to the final result and who won. Tell us who that was and how it broke down. Yeah, more than two dozen 2600s competed and a non-second Gujagosz Gajewski must have learned something by playing the, the legendary player himself. He wins with seven and a half out of nine. And Danny, it all came down to the critical ninth round game against Grandmaster Malkumian as Black, Black was pressing, and in the end game, it was one seemingly innocuous king slip. Malkumian moved his king from f2 to g1. It should have gone to e1. That would have deprived Gajewski's bishops an important diagonal, and that's what it came down to. Had Malkumian held that position, it would have been a two-way tie with Smirin and Gajewski, but because of the slip, Gajewski gets top honors all by himself. Well, congratulations. Big win for Mr. Gajewski. Now, somebody else will get a big win this week. We don't know who it will be, but the British Championships is getting set to start, and it's a much stronger field than it was last year. They're in Burnmouth, and guess who? Mickey Adams is going for his fifth career title. He won his first at the age of 19. The returning champion, Jonathan Hawkins, is not there to repeat, but even if he was, all eyes on Mickey Adams, and we'll see how they do. And competition ends August 5th. Seems the only big name missing is Nigel Short, but of course, should be interesting to follow the event nonetheless, and we will continue to follow all that you bring us at chess.com slash news each week. Thanks, Danny. Well, Robert, Victor Bolagon just can't get enough of seeing himself featured on Chess Center, even if it is for Blunder the Week. Not long after losing the World Open title in spectacular fashion, here he loses a completely winning attack to Grandmaster Korobov from the 17th karpov poikovsky tournament in Siberia going on right now. Tell everybody the move he played here that took the position from plus three to minus three in one single blow. Here, Bolagon played the move rook to f1, which looks very natural applying pressure on f7, but it actually forced his own resignation. The reason why is that their bishop takes d6, c takes d6, queen b6 check simply trades off the queens and removes an attacker from the f7 square, and after the queens come off, black will indeed be up a piece with a completely won position. So instead of rook to f1, Rook e1 would have won him the game. The reason why is that now bishop takes d6, c takes d6, queen b6 check does not work because after the queens come off to the board, there's rook e8 checkmate. And if the queen does not go to b6, forcing the trade there, a queen d7, let's say, now rook e7 hits that rook on f7. The game is completely lost for black. Knowing that Bolagon is now on complete tilt in his career, losing several more games at the Boykovsky tournament, you can't help but just have your heart go out to the guy. Obviously, someone needs to remind him it's not his job to be featured on Chess Center every week for Blunder of the Week. But either way, we, we do look forward to all of these exciting moments and shows that even grandmasters go through struggles, right? Even top GMs like that can make mistakes in back-to-back -back games. So too bad for Victor Bolagon. Too bad he didn't convert on this very nicely played attack. And too bad for him that we had to feature him one more time on Blunder of the Week. Hello, Chess.com, and welcome back to The Real McCoy. Now this week, I'm going to talk to you about the one-armed cluster bucket that is the Women's World Championship cycle. And believe me, when I say the word cycle, I mean it extremely loosely. The cycle has this connotation about something that occurs again and again over time. But in this case, it is more in common with a drunken one-legged pirate yeah. falling backward down an escalator. Uh, so the current cycle works like this. On even years, they have a knockout tournament. The same kind of knockout tournament that brought you world championship gems such as Klepin and Kazbedyanov. Uh, but that's only on the, on the even years. I kid you not, on the odd years, you have match play. Now, if that makes as much sense to you as maybe a smoking section on the Hindenburg, you're not alone. And it didn't used to be this way. There used to be completely normal interzonals that fed into candidates' matches that would give you the world championship match. Uh, and why did this change? Well... Around the year 2000, the Women's World Championship was changed to match the men's, uh, which was different because of the PCA split. Now, even after we repaired the men's World Championship, we never fixed the women's. Why? Because reasons. Uh, so look into my eyes, Fide. 
look into my eyes. Uh, I've got an idea for you. Why don't we keep the knockout tournament? I know you love it. I know it's exciting. But instead of having it determine the world champion, let's have it determine the challenger. And then they can play how you fawn at their will. So one little tweak and suddenly everything makes sense. Help me, Fide. Help me end the madness. Paula Cole once asked, where have all the cowboys gone? And we got the answer for her right here. They're living in time trouble. You ready to cowboy up? Rock on, Danny. Johan Solomon, 19-year-old Johan Solomon, just won the Norwegian Championship. Pretty young superstar on the rise. Has the Magnus Carlsen boom in Norway begun? Well, let's see how it compares. Fisher won in 72, U.S. won Olympiad gold in 76. So, in Batumi 2018, would we see Carlsen, Agnestine, Tari, and Solomon win gold? That's the timetable. Next up, Hari Kadranavali wants chess in the Olympics. Danny, is that a good idea? I think it'd be a lot harder to catch the Zika virus playing indoors, so why not? Chess seems to fit right in. Now, the Poikovsky Memorial is underway. This seems to be the strongest tournament every summer that just never quite gets the love it might deserve. Why do you think that is? I have a theory. It's called 3,000 kilometers east of Moscow in the middle of Siberia. Just a theory. <laughs> <laughs> Nidish, Smirin, Nisipianu, all cresting 2700. Will they get back over that threshold? You know, with old guys on the rise, seems like a renaissance. I can't guarantee whether they will or not, but I'm going to move on to the next question and hit you hard with Ronda just lost a big game. In fact, it was featured in our surprise of the week last week to Silvio Denilov, and it makes me wonder, will he ever get close again after losing so many points to 2700? He was at 2699.8, but you know what? Kaidanov once told me that Granda Zuniga has never read a chess book, so time to hit the books, Julio. Lastly, Caden Trough became the first Grandmaster ever to get the Boy Scout Eagle Award. Danny, were you the first IM to get the award? No, I, I never finished my Eagle Scout. Like every other middle-aged, depressed father, I'm living through my kids. Mike, like every other journalist we have on Chess.com, you rock it each week, and I will see you on next week's Chess Center. Thanks, Danny. At the Poikovsky Karpov Tournament. Poikovsky sounds like Shlotsky's. I could really go for a deli sandwich right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just totally made that up. That's too I good. I could go for a sandwich right now. I got to stop recording Chess Center when I'm hungry. <laughs> but it is leading to some exciting play on the board at the 17th Karpov Poikovsky Tournament. Say that five times fast. What matters is that we're going to have to review this game five times faster than we normally would. That reference makes no sense. I was trying to recover <laughs> from a mistake. <laughs> Mate. So instead, after que uh, Oh, my God. Well, after a beautiful attacking game by Bolagon, he really just made a mistake by one... Uh, Okay, let's do it again. I got this. It's not long after being shown to lose the World Open title to Pop in Grandmaster. Uh, <laughs> let's do that again. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, that was horrible. Do you want me to start? The Poikovsky, the 17th Poikovsky Karpov uh, Memorial. But Karpov's not dead. Is that a thing? Okay, we've got to restart. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> oh, that didn't work out. That was hilarious. <laughs> Denny, after two features in Blunder of the Week and three straight losses, I think Bulligan's going to have to change his first name from Victor to Loser. And here in this game... <laughs> <laughs> can I say that? Am I allowed to say that? I don't know if you can say that. A... We have the giggles. We have to stop. This is am out I... of control. <laughs> am I allowed to say that? On complete tilt, we need to remind him he's not required to get featured on Chess Center every week as part of his professional chess career. Uh, but we do appreciate the train wreck of moves. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing so well. The train wreck of moves. <laughs> oh my. We've completely lost it, man. Hello, Chess.com, and welcome back to The Real McCoy. Oh, my God, I just spit all over the camera.